Here we are already at our second quiz. This quiz is going to focus on electrons. Um, hopefully you have already tried the practice quiz before watching this video. Again, it's going to serve you best if you know what questions to ask. Obviously, as I explain things, it's going to make a lot of sense. But the question is, can you actually do this yourself? So it's really important that you've tried this first and then watch the video. So pause it and come back if you haven't tried it first. All right, question one is looking for the orbital notation. The orbital notation includes the different sublevels and orbitals within those, the S, P, D, F, and, and the different horizontal lines. So we're not just looking for the electron configuration, although knowing the electron configuration will really help you. So I'm going to pull in the periodic table, and we're going to look for chlorine. Chlorine is actually over here on the right. It's in group 17, and its electron configuration is 287. So I'm going to write that down because that's going to really help me as I do my orbital notation. The other thing I'm going to write down is my little cheat, my some people do fine, and then the odd numbers 1, 3, 5, 7. So what I've just written down are the sublevels, and they fill in that order, and then next to that are the number of orbitals or horizontal lines I would draw for each. So chlorine in the first principal energy level has two electrons. So first principal energy level, we always start with S. S has just one orbital and therefore can hold two electrons. So I'm done with the first. I can move on to the second. Again, starting with S, which has one orbital, can hold two electrons. Looking at our electron configuration, we can see we still have four more to fill, or six more to fill. So I'm going to need P, and P has three orbitals, and they fill following the bus seat rule. So we've already placed two in the second, so this is three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. So now I've finished my second principal energy level and need to move on to my third. And the third, once again, we're starting with S, which can hold two electrons. And then we still have five more to place. So we're going to need P, which has three orbitals. One, two, three. And then following the bus seat rule, we've already placed two in the third, 3s. So here's three, four, five, six, seven. And we're stopping there because that's all we have in the third. And that's how you do an orbital notation. All right, number two. How many unpaired electrons are in a neutral atom of phosphorus? Unpaired electrons are electrons sitting alone on the bus. There's two ways you can do this. You can draw out the orbital notation, or you could use a Lewis dot diagram. The only time you couldn't use a Lewis dot diagram is essentially with the ones in this section here or this section here. They kind of don't follow the same rules because of that Aufbau principle I mentioned before. They don't fill in the proper order, so you may actually have unpaired electrons that are not in the outermost principal energy level. So if you find that they are in groups 3 to 11, or they're in these two um, rows, these two periods, I would, uh, I would maybe draw out the orbital notation. Knowing that phosphorus, I should have found that first, is right here, I know that I can actually use a dot diagram. So I can ignore all the non-valence electrons and just look at the valence number, which is 5, and just do a dot diagram. So, oh, I'm still in red. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I have 1, 2, 3 unpaired electrons. All right, on to number three. Write the letters of the occupied sublevels. So we're looking for the S, P, D, or F found in the fifth principal energy level of bismuth. 
Now you may need to look up what bismuth is in table S. Bismuth is right here. What you're going to notice about the electron configuration you have here is if you started with 18 and counted over, you don't have five principal energy levels, but you may have noticed that the outermost principal energy level is always the row or the period. So that means that this is the sixth, and where you have that 18 is actually the fifth. What, what you may also notice about all of them starting at 72 is they start with a dash. The rest of them all have numbers to start it. And what you'll see starting at hafnium in number 72 is a little asterisk. And when you look down here, it says it denotes the presence of 2-8 for elements 72 and above. They would have had to change the font so that it was even smaller to fit all those numbers in there. So they left out the 2 and 8 and assumed you would realize that. So this is the number of electrons in the first. This is the number in the second, third, fourth, fifth is 18 electrons. So in order to fill in 18 electrons, we need to know which um, sublevels we'd need. So I'm going to finish out my little cheat here. I can fit two electrons here because there's two per um, orbital. So if I have three in P, that means I can hold six. So that's a total of eight. And then D has five, so that's 10. So add that to the eight, that's 18. And that's how many we had in bismuth. So we must need S, P, and D to place those 18 electrons. All right, number four, how many principal energy levels are occupied in a neutral atom of 10? So we're talking about the one, the two, the three, and so on. There's an easy way to figure this out once you've figured out what element tin is, and you may need to look in table S to do that. Tin is actually Sn right here. You could count the number of numbers in the electron configuration, which ends up being five, or you could look all the way back here. Whatever period it's in, these are labeled as periods, whatever period or row it's in, that's how many occupied principal energy levels you have in that element. So for 10, it's going to be 5. Number 5, indicate the number of valence electrons in a neutral atom of germanium. So all we're doing is looking for that valence number. So we need the electron configuration, and we're just going to take the very last number. So let's find germanium. Again, you may need to look in table S in order to figure out which one that is. It's right here, it's number 32. The last number in the configuration is four. So that's all they're looking for is the valence number or valence electrons. Number six, how many unpaired electrons are in a neutral atom of sulfur? So let's find sulfur. We know we can use a dot diagram as long as it's not in those weird groups. Here is sulfur here. And it's not in this section, it's not in this lower section, so we can probably figure it out just with a dot diagram. So we're going to look at the valence number, which is 6. We're going to draw that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Our unpaired electrons are 2. All right, for this next one, we're actually asking for two things. You have to name the element, and you have to state whether it's ground or excited. So in order to name it, we're assuming these are all atoms because that's what the question says. So they are all neutral, which means they have the same number of electrons as they have protons. The number of protons is the atomic number. So if we add up all of these electrons, that'll actually give us our atomic number. I'm going to do that first for all of these, adding up the electrons to get the atomic number. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the electron configuration they've given in the question with the one in the periodic table for each of those elements. The one in the periodic table is the ground state electron configuration. So if it's different, 
then it must be excited. The other thing you may need to do is look in Table S for the names. The names in Table S are listed by atomic number, so it's pretty easy for you to find number 29 and discover that the name of that element is copper. I'm not going to do that with you because that's something that um, will clutter up my screen, so I'm, I'm going to skip doing that. But that first element, number 29, is copper. And now we're going to compare this electron configuration with the one, whoops, with the one in this table. And what you're going to discover, this was given as 2818-1. Well, so is the one in the periodic table. So that means that it's in the ground state. Next one, number 38. When you look in table S, you're going to discover that that element is strontium. And now we can compare this electron configuration with the one in the table. And I can tell pretty quickly, because the one in the table is 2,8, that one of these electrons must have jumped up. So this is actually excited. Next one, number 27. 27 is right here. When you look in table S, you're going to find that's cobalt. Cobalt's electron configuration in the periodic table is 28152, which is exactly what it is here. So that means this is ground state. All right, number 10 we have is yttrium. It's actually named after a region somewhere in Europe. I can't exactly remember where. Um, yttrium, the ground state electron configuration is 2818.92, which is exactly the same. So this one is, again, ground state. Next one, number 15, is phosphorus. Phosphorus is in the periodic table 285. So that's not the same as we have here, so this must be excited. A lot of steps involved there in getting the answers, but it's certainly not impossible. Last question on the front, explain how light is produced. Light is produced when excited electrons fall back to the ground state. That's what happens to the energy that's released by those electrons. All right. We're going to draw dot diagrams or Lewis dot diagrams for all of these elements. Once again, having your periodic table is going to be essential. Our first dot diagram is for tin. Tin, again, is Sn right here. When we do a dot diagram, the only number that matters is the valence number, which is 4. I'm going to write that here. I'm also going to look up the others while I'm at it. Barium over here, number 56, valence number is 2. And radon, which is number 86 over here, its valence number is 8. So I can kind of move this out of the way for a couple of minutes. Tin, the symbol was Sn, and we fill in those dots. One, two, three, four. Barium, valence number is two, one, two. Radon, valence number is 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Again, I won't know if you filled those in in the right order or not, but if you don't get into that habit, you would have done this one incorrectly. All right, number 16, an atom contains 22 protons, 15 neutrons, 22 electrons. What is the mass of the atom? Given the information I gave you here, I could ask lots of questions. It's not going to be the exact same questions on your quiz, so make sure you try variations of it. Instead of asking for the mass, maybe I'm going to ask for the charge on the nucleus or the overall charge. 
Um, so there's more than one question I could ask based on the information given. This time, since I asked for the mass, the mass is due to the protons and the neutrons. So we're going to add those two together, and when you do, you're going to get 37. And you can say, for your explanation, because you don't get any credit without explaining, is 22 protons plus the 15 neutrons is how you figured that out. Don't need to be real wordy, though I gave you a lot of lines just in case you are wordy. What is the charge on a nucleus of gold? Gold is AU, so we're going to find that in our periodic table, which is right here. The only particles in the nucleus that have a charge are the protons, and the protons are the atomic number. Since I did ask for the charge, you also have to give me that. So it would be positive 79. Number 18, what's the most common isotope? Whenever I ask you to give me an isotope, you need to give me either the symbol or the name and the mass. So because I gave this rather small line, I'm going to do Kr. And the most common isotope is always the mass number from the periodic table rounded to a whole number. So that's going to be 84. We've gotten those masses on the periodic table by calculating the average isotopic mass. So if you round it to the nearest whole number, typically that'll give you the one with the greatest percentage that's naturally occurring in our planet. So that's, that's where that comes from. Number 19, how many electrons does SI4- minus have? Remember, electrons are negative. So this must have gained four electrons more than it normally does. So we have to figure out what it would normally have. Here is silicon here. An atom would have 14 electrons, just like it has protons. But it gained four, so it now has 18 electrons. Number 20, how many nucleons does the most common isotope of magnesium have? Remember, nucleons are protons plus neutrons, which is essentially the mass. So this time, we're just looking for the mass rounded to the nearest whole number. This was for magnesium. Here's magnesium, and it's 24. So again, when you study for this quiz, make sure you're asking yourself different questions. Maybe when you practice number 20, instead of asking how many nucleons magnesium has, maybe ask yourself how many neutrons it has. Or maybe switch out magnesium and make it a different element. These are ways that you can help yourself to study for the quiz, because that's actually how I make the quiz. Good luck on your second quiz.